This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out the YouTube original channel UCTV Prime at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Dr. Pauli is a leader in studying human impacts on global fisheries. Dr. Pauli created novel software documented in more than 507, uh, 500 scientific and general interest publications and used by ocean experts around the world. Initiated in 1999, the Sea Around Us project is devoted to studying, documenting, and promoting policies to properly manage fisheries in a way that protects the world's marine ecosystems. Through his teaching and research, Dr. Pauli underscores the importance of setting up marine reserves so that fisheries in peril can make a comeback. He warns that modern fishing practices left unmanaged will leave little but jellyfish and plankton in the sea for future generations to eat. A frightening vision of our oceans and our lives. And so now to satisfy your appetites, uh, here's Dr. Pauli to present his lecture entitled Jellyfish Burgers or How We Changed the Oceans and they changed us. Dr. Pauli. Yeah. Yeah. So, good evening, Nirenberg family, Scripps. Um, with a prize like that, I have to maintain the interest of the public for one hour or a little bit less. Uh, I will do that with, uh, with vignettes covering various topics. And I will try not to be wonkish. Uh, I have been this afternoon. And I will start with uh, something that was produced by a graduate student, a PhD student at your institute. It is a collection of three pictures. This is uh, in a pier in uh, Florida, a pier where people did day trips. And uh, with a little boat, uh, about 20 guys, uh, and perhaps the wives, they went in 56, and they came back with the biggest fish that they caught. And here they are in 56. And here they are at the same place with the biggest fish that they caught in, in the 80s. There were lots of these pictures. The same pier, the same location, and they, they fished at the same place using the same method. And here they are in 2007. And these pictures, uh, they, are, they were embedded. Uh, uh, that is the only pictures, the only PhD that you, give, that you gave in scripts based on photos, actually. Uh, and uh, this summarized the picture. <laughs> the, <laughs> this, this is the only uh, the scientific study and PhD that can be summarized in, uh, in one picture. Uh, and um, this is about sh shifting baseline. Actually, the concept I coined in 95. Uh, you see the guy in, uh, in, uh, today, he's also happy. Why is he happy? Because he doesn't know that in the past they caught this big fish. So his baseline, his happiness baseline in terms of fish that you catch has changed. And I will show you lots of examples of this shifted baseline, but here with the lessons. So shifted baseline is what prevents us from, from, from knowing that things have changed because we adjust to the reduced abundances. And trivially, fishing has a strong effect on fishing. We saw that uh, 
uh, in the, the case of keyword. And uh, you can da do some algebra or multiplication. If a picture is uh, a thousand words and three pictures was one aha, you have one aha is uh, uh, really 3,000 words. Um, anyway, um, this is how fishing then has evolved uh, from uh, 1950 to 2006. This is, this is the growth of fishing effort. Um, you see that North America has not much increased. You can, uh, you can be uh, happy about that. Europe has actually increased, and Asia has increased like crazy. And uh, this is uh, excess boats, but uh, these are the boats that are catching a world catch that is not increasing anymore. Since the late 80s, the fisheries of the world have ceased to increase. I'm using here FAO data, uh, data from the, from the Food and Agricultural uh, Organization of the United Nations. Actually, the decrease in blue is, uh, is more marked now, but uh, we'll, I will just pretend this is okay. We, we published this in 2001, and it showed basically that uh, the trend is not, was not going up. This was due, the impression that it went up, was due to China over-reporting catch statistic. And I will not, uh, this afternoon I explain why China over-report catch statistics. Uh, and I had a, somebody complaining about me picking up Spain as an example this afternoon, but uh, I prepared that slide when I went to Spain to get an award. So, uh, because you have to give something back. And, uh, <laughs> This is uh, Spain in the uh, 1950s, where they fished, and this is where they fish now. Now, I also said this afternoon, or presented these slides, that uh, I could do the same, uh, the same for France, the same for Japan, the same also for the US. Uh, a few countries, actually, about a dozen of them, fish uh, the world, and uh, other countries, like India or Brazil, uh, big countries uh, stand by the, by the sideline and exploit only the ex exclusive economic zone. And this is, uh, will come up as a, a big equity problem in the next decade. But China, uh, we've just finished uh, a study uh, that they are fishing vessels in all of these countries, Chinese fishing vessels, and they catch about 5 million tons of fish, which was not reported. Uh, they over-report the domestic catch and under-report the foreign catch. So, um, but uh, catches, comparing catches is not a good thing. Uh, adding catches uh, that you um, obtain in different parts of the world, because a ton of tuna is ecologically not the same as a ton of sardine, because uh, notably uh, tuna in sardine. And the best way to obtain a currency that can be compared between uh, species is to reduce them to the to the a common denominator. And if you imagine phytoplankton as being the grass of the ocean, and uh, the zooplankton as being the gazelles of the ocean, the prey fish being the lions of the ocean, and uh, the top predators being the dragons of the ocean. So we actually a table fish is a dragon, right? And uh, the sardine that you don't like, but other people like, uh, for example, in Spain and in France and stuff, um, this would be the equivalent of a lion. And the gazelles we don't eat because they are very small. So basically, because we know the conversion efficiency, the, the transfer of matter between one level and the other, and we know where each of the fish that are caught fits in the scale, the trophic level uh, of each fish, we can we can actually re-express everything in phytoplankton unit, and we call this primary production required. I introduced the term in 95, and this primary production required can be expressed as a function, as a fraction of the primary production that occurs. So how, many, how much of the grass that you have in this field is eaten by your cows? This is really that. And you can express this primary production required in color. So in red, you have 30% was required uh, 
in this part of the world that are red. And you can see that it corresponds more or less in the 50s to the countries that uh, were heavily industrialized and, and fished heavily in uh, Northern Europe, essentially, and a little bit around Japan. And now, this is where we get 30%, uh, 30% and more. And just this as a reminder, uh, we extract in the terrestrial realm, in other words, on the continent, we extract about 40% of the primary production. In other words, 40% of the grass and forest and everything is used by humans. Uh, for wheat and, and agriculture, it's also used for construction, wood and stuff. It's also paved over for supermarkets and, and uh, shopping malls, 40%. But 30% is uh, red in here and up. So really, we are using the earth very much. Now, this transition between 50s and uh, 2000, we can do it year for year, ratchet-like. And here is the increase of this primary production required. And you can see that uh, basically the fisheries, whether you use 10%, 20%, or 30%, increase at about a rate of 1 million square kilometer per year. So the, the area covered by fisheries, 1 million square kilometer per year. Uh, it's a metric unit. I don't know how many miles, square miles it corresponds to, but 4 million square kilometer per year, which we reach in the 80s, is approximately one Amazon per year. So the, the, the rate of expansion of fisheries uh, was about 1 million square kilometer per year. Then in the 80s, when the different countries declared exclusive economic zones, uh, Japan, for example, could not fish anymore in U.S. waters, they had to uh, go to the high seas beyond 200 miles, and uh, the high seas are more dilute in terms of fish, so they had to uh, explore far more. And the growth has ceased because essentially we fish everywhere. So, and, and this uh, movement, uh, this geographic expansion, occurred not only in in space, but also in depth. The boats are fishing deeper and deeper, one, two kilometers is common for big trawlers. And moreover, and that is uh, almost amusing, the, the rate of expansion southward is regular as almost as a metronome, and it's 0 0.8, um, 0 0.8 degree latitude per year. So you can calculate, actually, if you extrapolate, when all the fishing boats will be in Antarctica fishing krill. <laughs> and everything else will be essentially gone. And this is very regular, whether you use 10%, 20 or 30% thresholds. Now, basically, this phenomenon, which I, uh, with other colleagues, uh, coined in 98 as uh, fishing down, um, this tends to occur everywhere because, because uh, the big fish are replaced by small fish. And in, uh, in the ocean, contrary to, to land, when you're big, you are on top of the food web. It's not so on land. A wolf, for example, is smaller than its prey, a caribou. Uh, but on, in the water, it's simply because of hydrodynamics. The, the fish have to, to be pointy, like a Boeing or something. And they have to be pointy, and the mouth is usually at, at the beginning. So there's no, not much space for mouth. So they, are, they are, have a relatively small mouth, if you think of a, a tuna. So they have to eat small things. So if you're big, you can eat bigger things. So size is related to uh, uh, being on top of the food web, but it's also related to being uh, long-lived, because if you are big, you, you need a, a certain time to get there. So being big means uh, you're more exposed to uh, fishing, you uh, longer, you're exposed to fishing longer. So if you fish across the food web, the first to go will be, will be uh, the, the, the big fish, and then uh, gradually you, the small fish. And because we are smart, uh, we use trawlers, and the trawlers wipe out these nice little flowers, which are not flowers, 
but uh, which are living on the bottom, consolidate the bottom of the ocean. And this consolidation and this transformation of the of uh, habitat into from uh, a diverse habitat, um, especially in shallow water, in shallow tropical waters, into mud, a mud bed, is actually something that is happening on a grand scale. And I happen to have been there at the moment where certain areas that were not fished were transformed into mud beds. And I will show you these pictures, which I have retrieved a short while ago. They were used in a TED lecture that I gave uh, a while ago. You can, uh, the TED lecture. The, the, and they, were, they are quite unique because the, the, the fishing, uh, this transition uh, is usually not recorded. So the pristine ecosystem is when, when we have not been there. The present ecosystem, well, it's a present ecosystem. And a future ecosystem, that's what we're going to get, which we already have in many places that have been abused. And uh, this is a, a slide that I don't recommend my student to do because that's too much text. But basically, what do you have in a pristine ecosystem? You have large animals, and the water is clean. And the, at the bottom, there is lots of animals living at the bottom that eat the snow the marine snow. That's essentially what you have. And I refuse to show you one of these pristine ecosystems because this is what you see in National Geographic. But National Geographic has to go further and further and further to find them. You cannot go to Jamaica or to the Caribbean to find a pristine ecosystem because they aren't there anymore. They have to go to Kiribati. By the way, Kiribati is very important because it, it's written Kiribati. Uh, and if you say Kiribati, you kind of show that you, have, you know things, Kiribati. Um, so uh, the National Geographic has to go all the way to Kiribati to make this movie, and then they show how beautiful the world is. Actually, the world looked like New Jersey, the ocean, uh, most of it. Uh, but it, you can't show it because it, it is transformed and it is largely disgusting. So present ecosystem, what happens? The average trophic level of, this, of, the, of the fish that we land is going down. The coral cover diminishes. And we start having outbursts of, of uh, algae, harmful algae, here and there. Uh, and muddy areas in where the trawlers occur. I will show you all these things. And then at the end, you have the dead zones. You have only little fish. You have uh, jellyfish, and uh, you don't like that. And we'll see that these things. So this is, this is how it changed. Uh, the, the guy with the pink hat, pink hat, is me, with a, with a beard, on a boat uh, in uh, Indonesia, introducing trawling. That was the spaceship of the 70s. We introduced trawling into Indonesia. Uh, this was uh, working for the German project development project. And here is what we caught. 90% of the catch consists of, well, habitat. We're catching habitat. We're catching giant sponge that cover the, that cover the bottom. Uh, we're catching some fish. But most of it is habitat. These big things are all sponges that structure the habitat, uh, a muddy habitat, uh, turn it into a reef. So this was, these are reef fishes that live in a habitat that is now mud. And in the meantime, I have known, uh, I've discovered that this happened also in, in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. This happened also in the North Sea. All these habitat that are muddy were before rock, not rocky, reefy habitat. But it was soft reef that can be destroyed by trawling. And habitat, and we just threw it away. And at the time, we didn't know what we were doing. In other words, there were no word for what we were doing. We were just doing it. Uh, we were just doing it. But we had no word for, even there was in German no word for discarding at the time. The word has been in, in, uh, discovered, uh, developed in the meantime. For those of you who are into German, it's called Rückwurf. Yeah. And look at this. Do you see that? A turtle. Now, we caught lots of turtles. Uh, they were part of the bycatch. And uh, because the crew were, uh, 
They love turtles, but don't eat dead animals. So they were not eating them. We just threw them away. And then one time we found one that was still breathing. And they were going to eat it. No, no, I didn't let them. That was, uh, so these turtles. Now, we have killed, I know, I should have put a, a leather back, but, uh, you know, artistic license and stuff. Um, the turtles eat jellyfish. So do mola mola. So do chub, chum salmon. And uh, about 100 species of fish that are specialized on eating jellyfish. Um, we also troll on the bottom, and uh, uh, the polyps uh, have no competitors and no, no, no predators. So the polyps also love it. So we, really, we have encouraged the life stages of, uh, of uh, jellyfish everywhere by our activities. And so we have jellyfish galore everywhere. Uh, this is uh, the pictures from Namibia, where a system, a system dominated by fish, uh, sardine, and hake, has been turned into a system dominated by 14 million tons of jellyfish. Uh, and uh, these are not the one you can eat. And uh, <clears throat> a student, I actually don't work. My student work. One of them is here. Uh, she works. Uh, and uh, then I grab the results. And uh, anyway, um, this is, uh, I'm in the et al. Um, basically, we looked at, uh, or he looked, um, this is one of these ethical questions to say we or he or what. Um, he looked at uh, uh, lots of reports all over the world, including newspapers account. We, we have no hesitation to using newspaper account when they cover a good period of time. And in the majority, we got a, a, an increase in jellyfish. So we can confirm that this was the first paper, this is the first paper that unequivocally it says there are more jellyfish now than they were before. Um, what are the factors which anchor jellyfish? Well, one of them is dead zones. Uh, this is a word that we might as well learn. Uh, this is a, a, a zone of the an ocean zone where the change uh, brought about the, the system. And plus the inclusion of, uh, plus the uh, fertilizer that comes from rivers uh, add up to a situation where there is a, a gigantic bloom. And this bloom, they die, the algae die, and they fall on bottom, and the bacteria use up all the oxygen in the process of recomposing this bloom. And I'm, I'm saying this is also fisheries induced, because remember these animals that uh, all were removed by trawling, they all are plankton eaters. They all eat algae. And they actually eat the marine snow that falls on them. But they are gone. So now the marine snow rots. So it is not true that it is only the Mississippi, in this case, which caused the, the, the dead zone in, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in the Gulf of Mexico, or the dead zone in, uh, in uh, Chesapeake Bay. It's also the absence of filter feeders that could have handled. Uh, Chesapeake Bay is uh, known to have had enough oysters to clean up the bay in three days. Uh, here, they are absent, and they were wiped out 100 years ago by trawling for shrimp. Another possible cause for, uh, for uh, the increase that we have demonstrated is uh, marinas uh, and uh, coastal development. The polyps uh, are the the, the first colonizers of concrete. They love concrete somehow. And uh, at least uh, they can handle the stuff that comes out of concrete better than other animals. And uh, that is in marinas. The, the, the picture here was made from under a marina, uh, under a piece of plastic. And uh, billions of, uh, of uh, polyps that then strobulate. The word is strobulate. I cannot resist. This is not a nice word. They strobulate and uh, they, uh, they bud little uh, jellyfish. Mm. Another thing is we fishing for small fish. The biomass is gone. They cannot, uh, they, they cannot reduce the larvae of uh, jellyfish. 
And then trawling and dredging. Uh, that is a picture from space. You can see from space mud trails, the same way we can see contrail of airplanes. And you can even see when you look uh, carefully that th this is uh, uh, shrimp trawlers because they are two nets making two on it, uh, mud trail on every side and uh, a central mud trail by the propeller. Uh, sometimes you even see the birds around, around uh, flying about uh, around uh, and catching, uh, catching the, the discarded fish from space. So uh, jellyfish abound and this is one of the biggest jellyfish uh, that, uh, that occurs in uh, Nomura jellyfish. It is about as big as Volkswagen and uh, they come from China. Uh, actually, no Chinese colleague will admit to it, they, but the Japanese say they come from China. And uh, <laughs> I've been admitting, this, they were funny actually, because they do show up in, in Japan. They don't reproduce in Japan with, with they come from, from outer space. They have to come from somewhere. And the current uh, uh, goes that way. So they, they and they, they destroy all the fisheries, uh, the fishing weirs and the fishing net that are in Japan. They also destroy uh, all the, all the, the intake uh, power of the desalination plant in the Persian Gulf and so on. This is, this is a big problem. And so we have to do something about it. And <laughs> so um, this, is, <laughs> this is actually uh, a second prize uh, of uh, a design con contest that was run by the Very Serious Science magazine. Uh, it was won by one of my students uh, and postdoc, and now assistant professor uh, starting. You become an assistant professor with such things and other things. You will see one more of them. Uh, but uh, that, that Jennifer. But actually, it's only half a joke because jellyfish are eaten in China, in, in uh, Thailand, in uh, Japan, in Taiwan, and have eaten jellyfish, and here I am. So uh, some people say that's what we, but you cannot eat all species. You cannot. They're not all good. Uh, for interest, if some of you are interested in jellyfish, uh, some of the water is withdrawn so that the water content goes from 98% uh, to about 80%. And 80% is uh, regular fish. So you, when you eat them, they're not watery. They are um, like jello or some, something. And you can, uh, you can, have them in chunks, in oil soy sauce, you can have them, uh, yeah. So at this point, we'll have to, to come up with solution. And that Jennifer, again, uh, one of her cheap solution is, but it's not a photo, it's actually a montage. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not a, a photo, this, she made it up. Um, there was, uh, this is her position. And uh, uh, basically, there is, uh, the option, people think, that we can, through our stomach, regulate the fisheries. Uh, essentially, um, not eat certain product and push towards certain product. This, as a policy, can work, but it, it implies that you have a chain of custody, that you know where the stuff comes from. And uh, uh, various, uh, in, uh, studies that have been done in the U.S., for example, indicate that at least 40% of the fish is not what you think it is. It's another species. You have heard that uh, from the Fulton market that's, that sells uh, tuna that is not tuna and, and, and salmon that are not salmon that you think they are and to snappers that are not snappers and so on. This is uh, the big issue. Uh, you can the, the problem with uh, trying to regulate uh, this to consumer demand is extremely difficult because a chain of custody is not established. So the legislation that has to be pushed is to establish a chain of custody. And the, the attention that has been given to this uh, problem started the wrong, the wrong way because 
it assumes that uh, the, the, the consumers uh, can do something about it, but actually they cannot because the chain of custody is not there. And uh, the, the agitation that one does it probably has to be done at the level, not the consumer, but at the level of, of um, uh, the wholesaler. In other words, uh, what Greenpeace does, uh, distribute leaflet in, in front of whole, whole market or whole world or whatever, whole food, and, uh, and uh, intimidate the customer into not going in there. Anyway, uh, another aspect of fisheries uh, is that they ha are all heavily subsidized. The, the, the wrong version is, is this. Uh, you have uh, fish that are you know, produced as a function or that are harvested as a function of fishing effort. And the fishing cost, the straight line, um, in principle, determines where, the, where, you, where you end up fishing because the cost uh, is equal to your return, in principle. And in principle, then, uh, at that point, uh, not in principle, in praxis, um, the, the fisheries tell you, the operators want subsidies to reduce the cost of fishing, to, to reduce that line. Now think about what happened. You reduce that line, you make it lower, you actually reduce the catch. And, and this is crazy, but most politicians don't get that. Because in most, most other productive enterprise, whether, you, whether it's car, whether it's agriculture, uh, they, the, the increase of the something that you want to have is monotonous. There is always an increase, even if it's very, very, very expensive. It, uh, for example, you can, in agriculture, you can inject so much money into it that you have hydroponic at the end. But you will have a higher production. But in fisheries, the, the boats are not instrument that generate production, are not factors of production. They are not only harvesting. So they don't produce anything, the boats. It's Mother Nature would produce something. And so you cannot trick her by saying, I will have more boats, or I will reduce the cost of the boats, because she cannot do anything about it. Or, so the result is that you reduce the catch. And right now, the catch of the world declining is because we have too many boats. And the solution that is being offered is by many countries, including China, and the European community is more subsidies. And that will uh, inc decrease the catch further. That is a clear version of subsidies. But what in reality happens, this is a circulus viciosus, a vicious circle in English. And uh, you can start anywhere, because vicious circle are like that. Uh, let's start at 12 o'clock. You subsidize a fishery. What does it do? It, uh, it builds capacity more of it. And uh, you have this boat, and they have to expand. Uh, they have to go further to. Do I need to demonstrate that? I don't, because I have demonstrated before. So they go out, and they wipe out the fish there. They're destroying uh, ocean diversity. Do I need to demonstrate that? I showed you pictures. So then uh, they go further and further away. It's more costly. And what do we do? We throw more subsidies. And the subsidy uh, is uh, huge. Uh, until recently, the World Bank uh, assumed that about 20 million, 20 billion, sorry, uh, dollars was spent uh, annually. Um, actually, it's about 30 billion, um, because they had forgotten the country that don't report subsidy to the OECD. <laughs> so we, we added that. and. Uh, we had a student, again, uh, deciding that uh, he would call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Somehow the bad ended up being black. I wonder why this is always like that. Anyway, uh, the bad subsidies uh, are the ones that uh, cause more capacity increase. Uh, fuel, uh, fuel uh, for example, or, or, or purchasing boats. Uh, the gray, the white is uh, things like research, obviously, uh, safety at sea and so on. That is uh, management is that costs money, but uh, it's actually a good thing. And gray is things that uh, we don't really know whether this is uh, 
You remember the film, The Good, The Bad, and the Ugly? The, the ugly guy, the, is, he didn't know whether he was a bad guy or not a bad guy. At the end, he survives, right? Because uh, Clint Eastwood doesn't kill him. But because he turned out to be a bad guy, a good guy. Uh, you don't know. And uh, go, an example of such subsidies is uh, decommissioning subsidy. In other words, you, you offer fishers uh, money so they stop, uh, they sell the boat. Now, they can sell the boat, they go to Las Vegas or wherever fishers go, and uh, they, what, what do I know where they go? And they, they stop fishing. This is a good thing, you have reduced capacity. But they can also um, get the money for the old boat and use it as a down payment for the new one, which they often do. And depending on how the condition that are uh, associated with this uh, decommissioning subsidy, they can actually encourage uh, more capacity building. So uh, we call them ugly. And then people think that uh, aquaculture is going to be the solution because they, they have to learn two important things about aquaculture. First thing, aquaculture is the thing that happened in China. It's not a thing that happens here. China has more than two-thirds of the world aquaculture production. Okay, so when people brag about, oh, we are going to produce, the, the we has to include, has to be, we Chinese have to do that. Because, because in the West, we don't do aquaculture, really. And the aquaculture that we talk about in the West is very often the production of cannibals' fish. The super lion that I was talking about, dragons. And this is about economically as, as uh, no, ecologically as profitable as uh, raising gazelles to feed lions that we give the dragons to eat. And then we eat the dragons. That's ecologically what we do when we raise salmon or tuna. This is ecologically completely crazy, but, but it is economically profitable. Why? Because, because it has a luxury market. And where the only comparison can be made that I can make is with Ferraris. You know Ferraris, they, they are neat, they are red, and old guys like the Ferraris because, because they do what they are supposed to do. And you can see an old guy in a Ferrari that it works. It works. I have, a, I have a colleague who had a Porsche, and it did work. Uh, but they don't resolve the transport problem, right? They work, but they work for something else. And, and so aquaculture, the farming of carnivorous fish works, but it doesn't feed people. This is not what it does. Aquaculture can feed people, but it has to be like in China. So that is the problem that we have. When we talk about aquaculture, aquaculture is a wide spectrum of activity, and that spectrum covers uh, raising cockles, raising carps, raising tilapia in fresh water, or raising uh, bivalves, uh, mussels, and so on in, uh, in, uh, in marine waters. But raising tuna and raising salmon um, in feedlots is not going to feed the world. It's going to be a luxury product like a Ferrari. However, one third of the fish is, turn, is being turned into animal feed. Uh, and uh, we don't know that chicken and pork and stuff, they don't swim. Uh, they, don't, they don't feed on fish normally, uh, except in Bahamas. They, they are the swimming pigs. I've discovered them a few weeks ago. The swimming pigs, Bahamas. Uh, I have a former student who is now looking about how they, she told me they, the snout gets sunburned because they, they exp <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is an absolutely wild story. Anyway, the one third of, of the fish uh, catch of the world is uh, little fish. Remember the gazelles of the ocean? Uh, and uh, these actually are excellent to eat. And uh, 
You, you guys don't want them to want, want to eat them. That's okay. We like them. And uh, in Europe, uh, uh, they are the Spaniards. They love uh, anchovies. The Italians love them. The French also love them. And the Peruvian, who are exporting every year uh, the equivalent of five to eight million tons of anchovy as fish meal, are beginning to understand that they can turn them into excellent food and uh, could export them as uh, food for humans. And presently, they have 3% of the, of the anchoveta uh, catch turned into, into human food. And uh, that's the biggest reserve that humankind has of fish. It can dwarf aquaculture production because the, presently, uh, the anchovies and so on are used to make fish meal, which is used for pig, chicken, and salmon. But you need three times more, uh, more fish meal than you get on salmon. So why not eat this, the fish right away? The, they have more omega-3. Why do you think salmon gets omega-3? They get them from the anchovies, from the fish meal they get. So everything is fine. I'm, that's my last picture. Basically, fisheries are, as many people will tell you, an extremely complex thing. By the way, when somebody tells you a problem complex, uh, you know that they don't understand because everything is complex. So that's not a descriptor of anything. But uh, fisheries really consist of two big sectors. Uh, and ev in every country, there is a large-scale sector and a small-scale sector. The small-scale sector, and I'm not being a romantic here. Uh, very, I'm, I'm being very, very specific about my numbers. Even with, if we account, if we account for the fact, if we don't account for the fact that the catch of small-scale fisheries is systematically underreported, they catch about the same amount as industrial fisheries. The, the jobs are easily created in terms of dollars. They don't need much fuel because, because they don't go places. And, and because they are tied to place, they are not uh, involved in this monster Ponzi scheme that fisheries now are. Um, in other words, going to forever to new places because you have devastated what you had in the back. And so I, I personally believe that the future of fisheries if it has a fishery, it, if it has a future, it's going to be small-scale fisheries. And small-scale fisheries in the U.S. also exist. This is uh, recreational fishing. This is subsistence fishing. This is small-scale owner-operated fishing. And uh, the, the social, economic, and other benefits are much bigger. And if people ask me, as a, it's a lame joke, but if people ask me, where, how come this is the large-scale fisheries, in spite of these differences that get promoted because the small-scale fishers usually don't play golf. Um, and uh, the stuff that I have presented to you tonight uh, is not the stuff that one person does. It, it's uh, teamwork. I, I really, uh, all I do is orchestrate nowadays. And uh, um, these are some of the people that, who work with me, and uh, I get uh, uh, serious funding from the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, I have gotten such funding for 12 years. And uh, this is one of the few donors that uh, lets me work on a global basis. There are very few people who let you work on a global basis because the, the most donors want to have their little patch uh, studied. But uh, Pew lets me work on a global basis. And thus, we have been able to produce uh, baseline data that a huge number of NGOs and groups have been able to use because we have been able to work on a global basis. So thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for some questions. and. Um, you may have seen the blue cards that were handed out earlier. If you'd like to write down a question, please do so and pass it to the outer aisles, and my colleagues here will collect them for you. 
Uh, we are running a competition in connection with the questions. Um, there will be a prize for the briefest quest written question. And there's uh, no prize for the longest answer. No. I was, thank you, Dr. Pauli. There's no more prizes for you. <laughs> so, um, they're not going to win here. Then these ones are not going to win. That's why they're the first two. So the first question uh, is, most restaurants in San Diego seem to be oblivious to the threats posed to many species they routinely serve. What do you think is the best way to reach the chefs of these restaurants? Uh, my student, yep. Jennifer Jacquet, uh, in the meantime, assistant professor somewhere, uh, she had have a, outsourced uh, my brain uh, for her to answer this. She would say, she would say, is it a problem where we have to work uh, positive reinforcement or shaming? Do we want to shame them? And there are lots of situations where shaming actually works better than reinforcing uh, positive stuff. And so there is no reason why uh, a few young people should not go with clown suit or something and uh, with a few posters. And this restaurant uh, sells illegal fish. Uh, and so that everybody knows. You would see that uh, within a week, they would capitulate. That's one method. Thank you. Uh, that, that's one method particularly suited to young people, uh, <laughs> adventurous and stuff. Um, Question number two. How do you break the per pervasive circle between the fish meal industry and the pig, chi pig chicken industry? Uh, I think that, uh, that this will will evolve positively because um, essentially the, the, this, the, this market for fresh, uh, for, for fish eaten, being eaten directly is offering far more and, uh, than the fish meal industry. And uh, so the demand uh, for, for fish, uh, for small fish also, will uh, let have the price increase. In Peru, you get a few bucks for a ton of fish meal, but you get uh, one, one or two dollars per, per fish uh, if you sell it uh, on ice and in a good quality. And I, I think uh, some of you will be happy to say that. The market will sort it out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you believe that marine protected areas are useful for species rehabilitation? Well, actually, uh, this is not only a belief. Uh, you see, this expansion that I'm talking about that uh, happened since uh, the invention of, of application of fossil fuel to fishing, really, uh, on a grand scale, on an on a earth-spanning scale, uh, this expansion has closed all the protection that the fish had naturally from us. Uh, depth was a protection. Uh, cold was a protection. Ice was a protection. Uh, storms were a protection. All of this, rocky grounds were a protection. And because we couldn't fish in this area. And with it, technological de development, GPS that allows us to put the net exactly between two rocks, we can now go everywhere where the fish were protected before. So if we don't create spaces where the fish can be, can do their thing, they will go. They will go. Because uh, fishing is adapted to what is most abundant, uh, generally. You target uh, this fish, the other fish that you catch, you will catch them incidentally. Uh, and if they have a life, uh, life uh, uh, longevity that is uh, superior to that of the target fish, you will destroy them. The, the bycatch will always be overfished. So basically, we will lose all the big fish if we don't have marine protected areas, if we don't invent a replacement for what was naturally there. And this is, in fact, the natural protection was, that existed before before we developed all this technology, is the reason why the Native American, for example, could, could, sub, uh, could live uh, 10,000 years in here, exploiting uh, coastal resources. 
and why fisheries uh, have existed in the Middle Ages that lasted hundreds of years. Because they couldn't go after the last fish, but now we can go after the last fish. And that is essentially, my protected area is not uh, an idea that comes from left field. And, uh, th this is the natural uh, uh, counterpart to the fact that uh, the fisheries are expanding in space and in, in, the, in various uh, in the spaces where fish uh, have hidden. Thank you. But we're moving on to the short answer <coughs> questions now. Um, do more sustainable fishing methods like pole and line have the potential to be scaled up to meet the national and global demand and yet let stocks recover? Yes, though <clears throat> at the end of the day, it is not the gear that you use, it's the number that you extract it's, that is, determines how much, whether a stock is sustainable or not. So yes, pole and line should replace trawlers because the trawlers remove habitat, but the fact that you use pole and line is not sufficient. Uh, they, you, you, you also must use fewer pole and lines. It's all obvious, obviously. The next question, will radioactive material in the ocean affect fish communities worldwide? Oh, that's the last problem we have. I think, I think, uh, I, I think even after Fukushima, I don't think this is really something that we need to worry. Very good. Is increased acidity in the ocean increasing jellyfish populations? I don't know that. I, I, don't, I don't know that. Uh, I don't know the differential um, susceptibility to, uh, to oxygen, to, sorry, to acidity, acidity between jellyfish and fish. What is, what they do have a differential susceptibility to oxygen, uh, to lack of oxygen, but I don't know about acidity. Very good. Um, here's a request for you to talk about farming of vegetarian fishes like tilapia. We know, I have, we know what I it have, means. I have mentioned that uh, the only aquaculture that can that can really feed people potentially on a, on a grand scale is the aquaculture of herbivores. But this is a, a problem. The tilapia, we thought about them as an aquatic chicken and so on, but uh, let's not forget that uh, when you grow uh, freshwater fish, you, have a, you compete with agriculture for water, and that is a big problem. There are certain countries where aquaculture is doomed because of water scarcity. What, what do you think is going to happen as the uh, bluefin tuna population is further decimated? H how do you think our society is going to react? Oh, we will, we will, we will eat something else. <laughs> Big deal. <laughs> um, because of shifting baseline, we won't even know it. Actually, when we eat surimi, what is it, surimi? You know what it is? This, uh, the, the, the press with the water under pressure, all the, the little fiber from the, from the skeleton after they have removed the fillet, and these little fibers uh, of uh, muscles of fish is compacted into fish sticks, I guess, and it's, uh, it's surimi. And I found surimi even in France in a supermarket, even in France. So that stuff, yeah, the French are supposed to eat well. That stuff is even in France. So if we eat can eat surimi, big, we don't need tuna. Um, directing attention to the PhD research area, what problem do you think needs the most attention? This is free advice I think you're giving you. What yeah. problem do you think needs the most attention and where can they make the biggest difference? Uh, I will really plagiarize uh, uh, the advice uh, that you will find in uh, Advice to a Young Scientist by uh, Sir Peter Medawar, the uh, Nobel Prize winner. He had written a nice little book called Advice to a Young Scientist. Basically, you have to pick big problems. If, if you, he gave the example, if you pick up a problem, uh, why, why half of the uh, sea urchin eggs are spotted, uh, you will have only one person who is interested. Uh, why the other half of the sea oceans uh, are not spotted. And uh, this is, nowadays there is, uh, we, we need uh, to attack problems that, are, that uh, feed into policy. Um, and 
also we must attack problems, I think, that are, not, that are thematic and not local. Uh, because we need solutions that work in several places. Because lots of people cannot do the research that you can do here at Scripps. So you do it doing it for the world. Yeah. I think this is going to be our last question and I think our prize winner. We, we have many more questions, but your 14 hours of work today are up. So I'm, I think this has to be it. Can jellyfishes be used as fertilizer? Yeah. That's a short answer. <laughs> would, would you join with me in thanking Dr. Crowley again? Thank you.